Hi guys, thank you very much and welcome back to Nipper's War. So we all know who Nipper Ellis is. Longer name, Steve Nipper Ellis. Nipper is just a nickname. For the people who don't know who Nipper Ellis is, he is famous in this story. He does play a major part. Fortunately or unfortunately for him, that may be a good or a bad thing. We just don't know. If he's receiving funds and monies from film companies and book companies for the use of his name in any of these stories, I would say that's quite respectable and quite well deserved. Bernard O'Mahony has written a book about him. It's called Last Man Standing. And he himself appears in many interviews in documentaries about the Essex boys just basically telling the story from his own opinion from his own point of view and overall given a greater outlook on the position he held and the position Tony Pat and Craig held he has first-hand experience with all three Tony Pat and Craig and more vitally so he has first-hand experience of witnessing the chain from decent to demon in Pat specifically, Nipper and Pat were good friends at one point. So much so that when Pat was in trouble and he needed a place to stay, Nipper Ellis invited him into his flat and let him stay with him. So you can tell from just that that he considered Pat a mate. And Pat at one point was a good decent bloke. It's always been said by people throughout all of these stories that there was a big distinct change in Pat's personality. And personally, I can't be sure exactly when that happened, but from reading a recent statement, it suggests that Pat started to go funny around November 94, December 94. But this is coming from somebody who had lent Pat money and hadn't seen him regularly over the last few months prior to that so it could have been earlier than November or December but he himself distinctively noticed a most definite change in Pat November to December 94 so much so that he himself wanted to start moving away and not be involved as much with Pat T. I think you'll have heard me mentioning that statement. It was the man who lent him money, 10 grand, and Pat kept paying back all his money, and then he invested another 15, and then there was another 10 on top of that, and Pat always paid. Although Pat was changing, and there was most definite change in his personality, however, this man said that Pat always kept up with his repayments. So to me, that suggests that Pat most definitely did have good intentions. He did have good intentions, but he was being led away by something so much darker, so much evil, something that was began to control him. And it just so happens that this was around the time that Pat started taking heroin and crack cocaine. So it should speak for itself that that is probably the reason why Pat started going off in a different direction. Half of him is saying, come on, let's go down here. You know, it's that story of the devil on the shoulder, isn't it? There's the, the devil saying, come on, this way's better. And it's leading you into complete shit and a complete nightmare. And then there's the other side saying, no, look, if you stay on this track, you'll be all right. Pat was a good person at one point, but he was being controlled and led away by these drugs. And with that, you can't become and you can't stay as a well-focused person if you've got all that going on in your mind. That just goes without saying. Unfortunately, that was it for Pat. Slowly but surely, Pat was led away by this evil demon side. And eventually, we all know what happened to Pat. It may feel good at the time, but it will take everything you've got. And in Pat's case, it took everything he had, including his life. But whilst Pat was safe and secure in a home, namely Nipper Ellis's home, it seems that Pat sort of got tied up in and st started to fall in with the rolling crowd, shall we say. Tony Tucker, Craig Rolfe came on the scene more and more. They were party boys, party animals, it's suggested. And where people would take usually uh, one, two ecstasies on a Friday night, Tony, Pat, especially, and Craig at some points just kept going, went on and on and on and on and on. The ecstasy 
on a Friday night turned into ecstasy and cocaine and then it turned into four ecstasies and four grams of Charlie and then 10 ecstasy on a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, crack, cocaine, speed, weed and don't forget the steroids all played a massive part in Pat's demise. When that starts happening to any human being, they stop caring. And slowly but surely, they will most definitely start to lose everything. But they don't care. Their friends will start distancing themselves from them. And they won't notice. There'll be complaints from family. And they'll be brushed aside. And then it'll start affecting the family. Upsetting them. And then the people closer to you in your own social environment will slowly and surely fall victim to abuse, vicious attacks, and in Tony Pancraig's case, bullying. Now Nipper was a friend to Pat, and he was living with Nipper, but outside the home, Tony Pancraig were doing what they were doing, and it was only a matter of time before Pat started to turn on his friends, and he didn't care because drugs made okay. Drugs made him feel that it was all all right. Nothing else matters to a drug user because they're all right. They're finding the comfort from something else. They don't need friends. They don't need family. They've got what they need over there in the form of a substance, a little powder. So it doesn't matter how they treat people. Drugs are their mates, but drugs are not people. Drugs are not people with feelings. You can treat drugs like shit all you like and you'll never get a reaction. You'll only get a little bit more comfort from them. But it's not like that with human beings. You can't treat a human being like shit and expect no reaction. Now some people, when pushed, they'll put their hands up, they'll admit defeat more or less straight away. They don't want anything to do with it. They walk away. Some other people, when pushed, They'll stand and fight. They may win or they may lose. And if they're pushed again, they can't be bothered with it. So they end up walking away as well. But some people don't back down. Some people won't admit defeat. Some people, when pushed, will push back. And they will never surrender. Some people are just not fearful. Some people, if they're hit with a fist, they'll come back with a boot. And if they're hit by a boot, they'll come back with a stick. If they're hit by a stick, they'll come back with a gun. If they're hit with a gun, they'll come back with a tank. If they come back with a tank, they'll come back with an army. It's just the way it goes. They literally want to go to war. And Nipper Ellis was one of those people who was not fearful of Tony Patton Craig. He did not back down when pushed. He did not take their bullying lightly. He did not want them to get away with the things that they were doing to him. The man was in war with these people. So let's go from the start. If you listen to this. And I, I should really explain to the tape um, what it is you're a suspect for, which is the murder of uh, Pat Tate, uh, Craig Rolf and Tony Tucker in uh, Essex, Reckenden in Essex, on the night of the 6th to the 7th of December this year. Yeah. Do you understand that? Yes. Okay. Um, I, I think that the, all, all those three of those people are known to you, is that correct? Yes. Can you tell me about your association with uh, let's take one at a time, Pat Tate? Um, I met him Pat Tate for. Met Pat in prison in January 1990 in Chelsea Prison. Uh, he'd just been brought back from Gibraltar, where he was uh, um, extradited, is it the word? Um, he was yeah. brought back to England yeah. anyway. I was in there for a robbery, or a robbery charge that was eventually dropped. Um, I was into keen into bodybuilding, and I didn't really know what to do. Pat was a bodybuilder. He basically took me under his wing, showed me how to do it. Mm -hmm. And uh, we become friends. Right. Uh, I stayed in touch with Pat when I was eventually out released from prison in April '91. Pat was then serving a 10-year sentence, which he got knocked down to eight in appeal. Um, I stayed in touch with him through my prison sentence and through his prison sentence. And when he was released on parole in the summer of '94, he came out. We were still good friends. We started seeing a lot of each other, getting involved in just doing, you know, what his friends do. And uh, he eventually had trouble with his girlfriend because they'd been apart for so many years. They were living in a cramped conditions in Basildon. And he uh, asked me if I could move into my house, my flat. I had a large three bedroom flat. Pat just basically said he'd like to move in for a couple of weeks. 
so he could sort his life out with Sarah because they were buying a bungalow and they would eventually move into that and he'd be okay to move out, you know, and then him and Sarah would be okay. A um, couple of weeks turned into a couple of months, probably you know, come back three or four months. So you heard it for yourself there. He was in prison with Pat. Pat introduced him to bodybuilding. They were good friends. Pat took him under his wing. And ultimately, that friendship turned into Pat relying on Nipper in the way of a place to live. And it's important to remember that date as well. Summer 94. And it's quite interesting, isn't it? And it's just a very good example of how things can change so quickly because fast forward a year later, Pat Tate was in prison for carrying a gun because he wanted to kill Nipper after Nipper had shot Pat. So as friendly as it all was between Nipper and Pat, it was mentioned that Pat asked for a couple of weeks and then that couple of weeks turned into a couple of months. But in that time was introduced to Tony Tucker and Craig Rolfe. So, so they were all mates, all friendly with each other. Tony, Pat, Craig, Nipper, they like each other, they get on with each other. And I would suggest they all trust each other because it seems that Nipper was aware of their drug use and he probably joined in a lot of that as well. Personally, I don't know if Nipper was ever on drugs, whether he was a drug user whether he liked a bit of cocaine now and again, or pills, or what, I just don't know. But by the sounds of it, in that world, I would suggest that, yeah, every now and again he had a sniff. But I wouldn't like to comment to say that he most definitely was, I just don't know. The amount of cocaine that Tony and Craig were actually bringing in would suggest that it was always around and readily available, and is bound to have been offered to him. Whether he took it, I just don't know. But it's about trust and it's about how much you can trust other people. Obviously, Nipper knowing that they were all on drugs and getting into drugs and heavily on drugs, as you heard him say there, that makes Nipper quite a trustworthy person as he's accepted it. Nipper's all right with it. Pat's living at his house. He tells us there that they were into drugs and then heavily involved in drugs more than he thought in the initially. So he definitely knew they were on drugs. So it was around him, and I can't see it being one of those situations where Nipper's laying down the rules, saying, you know, this is my flat, I know you take drugs, but, you know, please don't bring any drugs in. Nipper's in this environment himself, he is a criminal, a thief, so I would say that he's allowed it, he's allowed it in his flat, he's allowed it around him. And you know, I don't think Nipper's the sort of person to have, like, a plaque on the front door with rules for his tenant. One, wipe your feet. Two, if your coat falls on the floor, please pick it up. Three, always flush the chain. Four, when ladies are present, please make sure the toilet seat is down. Five, no smoking. And six, although I'm all right with drugs, please none in the flat. I honestly don't think Nip is that sort of person. I think, you know, he knows that what's going on and he's involved in this world anyway. He's a criminal himself. He's a thief. So, interested possibly taking part in some of the drug dealing you never know there was a lot of money being handed about and flashed about by the sounds of it by tony and pat and they were making a lot of it but what tony and pat did was once they got the money they'd spend it on more drugs it was one of those ever-ending cycles they would make money and then spend it make it and spend it uh, they were getting their drugs for free off people. We'd often go out and Tony would like go up to say a beer in a club or something and say to them, or like, you know, got any drugs or you said, no, you want to any drugs? And they'd say, yeah, what do you want? You tell them. When whoever come along with the drugs, Tony would just take the drugs, slap, slap, slap them around the face and tell them to go away. So they were getting their drugs for free when they went out. They were just robbing people all the time. And when they were getting money, they were spending it on drugs. And basically they just, uh, they robbed off others for themselves. Um, and they were just heavy drug users, but they could afford to, you know, they could afford, they could afford their habit, you know, because people would like to suck up to them and give them drugs and give them money because they feared them. Mm. And uh, where they were getting into this drug scene heavily, I, would, I began to break away from them. I didn't want nothing to do with them. I advised my girlfriend not to. I didn't want her associating with Pat, Tony and Craig's girlfriend. Well, it was Pat and Tony's, not Craig's. I asked her to stay away. So, in a very short amount of time here, Tony and Pat have actually become very heavy users. And with this heavy use, we've heard, especially in Tucker, 
but I wouldn't pull it past Pat as well or Craig. This is like a first insight or one of the insights of the bullying we all know about. And it's hand in hand as well with the thieving off people, robbing off other people that we all know about too. We know that Tony Pat and Craig were robbers and they robbed off all these different people and they bullied people. What Nipper's on about here is a prime example of both of those in one incident. Tony walks up to somebody, asks him if he can get any drugs. This man says, yeah, what do you want? He comes back with the drugs and literally steals the drugs off this man. Gives him a slap, tells him to fuck off. That's bullying and thieving all in one incident. Easy. And when it's easy, you'll do it again and again and again. And this is what seems to happen with Pat and Tony, especially. And Craig will have got involved because he was always with them. Now from an outsider looking in, when somebody tells you a story like that, you'll say, what a thug, they're thugs, they're animal. But looking at it from a different angle and putting yourself in their shoes, Tony and Pat's shoes, it could be said that they were just having a laugh. They could do it, so they are doing it. And you heard the words there that Nipper used, fear. They used fear to do what they did. And think about that for a second, you can guarantee that most of that came from Pat's size. There's bound to have been times where Craig was being a bit of a bully instigator. And because he was slim and not so well built, you know, the person who's being bullied would probably have stuck up for himself in front of Craig. But then enter somebody like Pat Tate, who dwarfs Craig and then starts sticking up for Craig. You're just going to hand over everything, aren't you? The fear of that itself is enough for you to hand over anything you're being bullied for. And if you are that sort of person who says, no man, I'm, fuck you, I'm not having this, enter Tony Tucker as well, and I would say that's enough to make you at least fearful enough for you to then drop your guard and say, all right, fuck it, I have whatever I've got. With fear, you can take anything off anybody. That's how the Cray twins work, all based on fear. But you can imagine this fear being forged, if you like, by the drugs. The drugs gave them the confidence to do this. Their size and their weightlifting and their training made them realize that they could get away with this kind of behavior. And it all goes hand in hand, doesn't it? Once you know that, that's it. It becomes easy and you'll do it again and again. But in Tony Pan Craig's life, they thought they could do that to anybody. Well, let me rephrase that. They thought they could do it to anybody and they did do it to anybody. They robbed gangsters from Canning Town. Now, personally, you'll have to forgive me. I don't know. I don't know how to compare Canning Town with this Essex firm. But I hear on the grapevine, I must admit I have only heard it. But I hear that Canning Town are the ones to not mess with. Don't fuck with them, no matter who you are. You could be the Italian Mafia, the Turkish Mafia, but you can't fuck with Canning Town. That's what I hear anyway. I've read a few things about that and, you know, they are fairly scary. And it's just another example of how these criminal gangs and these well-organised gangs run on fear. You only have to read one article on a man called David Hunt and it will make you not want to cross this man. That's how fear works. Imagine robbing somebody and then somebody going, doesn't matter that you robbed me, but you've just robbed off David Hunt. You'll want to hand it back and apologise and not only will you want to hand it back, you'll want to hand back more so as not to cause any trouble with him. And this is how Tony and Pat worked. Fear got them everything they wanted. But still, at this point, they were still friends with Nipper. But as you heard, Nipper has started distancing himself. This is going in the wrong direction. He can see it, so he's moving away. But you can see what's going to happen here, because now he's in a bit of a sticky situation here now. He can't distance himself from Pat because he lives with him. So I think you can use the word dangerous. Nipper sees this situation with Tony and Pat as dangerous. He started distancing himself. And he's seen it as dangerous enough to say to his girlfriend, look, things are getting out of hand over there. Where Pat and Tony are, the girlfriends are, and Nipper's girlfriend's associated with Pat and Tony's girlfriend. So he said, look, it's getting dangerous, getting out of hand. 
don't want you associating with them anymore. I'm distancing myself, you should do the same. And I can only imagine that some kind of fear has hit Nipper. And can you imagine how that must feel? Seeing this kind of behavior in town and seeing what they're doing to these people, seeing how they're acting on drugs. And this man is coming back to his own home to live there. There must be some kind of fear there of the situations that could arise. But as it was suggested earlier in some people, they will just let the guard down and let it all be and let the perpetrators win. But there are some people who are not like that and where they fear for their loved ones or they fear for their lives or they fear for something in their own lives against certain perpetrators they're not going to back down but they'll defend themselves instead and this is what comes across to me about nipper is that he is that kind of person who will defend himself he won't back down he will defend himself and that just one level of defense is protecting his loved ones and his girlfriend saying you know look that's a dangerous situation over there get back and you know who wouldn't do that most of the people who know Tony Pan Craig at this time have now started distancing themselves. People have started protecting themselves now, saying, well, no, that's too much. I'm protecting myself. I'm protecting my wife, my girlfriend. I'm moving away. I'm distancing. I'm, I'm, I'm stepping back from this. This is a little bit too much. I can't be doing with this. Tony Pan Craig are literally going hell for fire with it. And they don't give a shit like it was mentioned earlier as well. They found this drug. They're on these drugs. These drugs have taken control of them. And they are controlling them to the point of them not caring about anything. All these people are distancing themselves from them. And they couldn't give a shit. But it's just that one little bit different for Nipper. Because Pat is there living in his flat. And it's only a matter of time now that Pat is now just about to turn on Nipper himself as he possibly has done to hundreds of people already in the clubs about town through his behavior on these drugs through fear he's probably taunted and humiliated at least a hundred people and what goes around comes around and pat tate is just about to come around onto nipper ellis it's no different for nipper just because Pat's living in his place. Pat turns nasty, goes on the offensive. Nipper actually goes on the defensive. Bottom line is that Tony Pancray grew out of control here and they were ripping everybody off. Now, the, not only were they getting out of control on heavy drug use, they were going for bigger and better criminal activity as well. I say bigger and better, I say bigger and better for them. Their greed has intensified. If they know that somebody's got 50 grand, they want it. You know, it's just the, they'll go for bigger opportunities, as is the case of the traveller's checks. One of the movies I've heard is, uh, that was hurt, it was, uh, it was about a dodgy TC deal. Quite a big traveller's checks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, I, don't know, I don't know whether that was all part of it as well. That, that was something that added it to they, they basically there was a deal set up. Yeah. Um, one of my mates knew some people who had a quarter million pounds worth of traveller's checks. Uh, they were meant to come up. I, I spoke to one of Tony's mates, he said he was interested in the deal, but he couldn't. He had to get a quarter of a million pounds for 60 grand. He couldn't raise the 60 grand, so the, I said to my mates, you can't get it. Um, they then come back, the bloke found this, this 125 grand's worth there for 30 grand. Um, so I said to Tony's mate about it, Tony's mate said, yes, definitely out in this time. The deal was set up, I went to check they were real travellers checks, come back with some examples. I come back. There was Pat, Tony, the bloke, the third bloke was with them when Tony and Craig robbed me, and one of Tony's mates, the one who was going to buy them, these four people. With me, there was my two mates, the two mates who set up the deal. Yeah. Right, so there was seven of us. One of my mates was with the bloke who was selling the traveller's checks in a pub in London, and I'd come back by myself. Come back by myself, my other mate was there. Right, he's in the car with me. Sorry, that was it. We all went up, we all come back. Me and me, mate, I called them, I don't know, I called my mates. One who was in there was one, one who was in the car with me, number two, right? Because I don't want to involve these, although they, you know, whatever. Well, it's perhaps best we don't talk about this now, then. Yeah. Well, basically, what it was is we went up, they didn't have the money. The sole intention was to rob the people of those travellers' checks. 
the bloke's come out of the pub, Pat's it about and started beating him up. I'm sure oh, I saw Pat off him. But they, they weren't carrying money anyway? No. So it was, it was basically going to be a... Basically, you set him up, right. just beat the shit out of them and yeah. kind of stuff. And right. I went, man, you, you're treating people like shit, they're my friends. So they were going to rob them for the for the TC? For the, yeah, for the traffic checks. Right. And they had no money on them? Nothing at all. It was a complete setup, right. and they only told me okay. when I got back. And you, and you, you admitted that? Yeah, in effect. without knowing that yeah. they were going to rob my exactly. mates. All right, so you already felt a bit sharp so, about so that. So that, that was something else to add to the fire. Yeah. And then, and where, where did that come chronologically? In the, I mean, did that come while Pat was living with you? Yeah, yeah. Right. And so it, as well as as well as well Tony having the up with you, mm. you had the raving up with Pat and Tony yeah, having the over on that one. Yeah. Really, and making you look a prat in front yeah. of you. Yeah. Because I suppose you're... you're Blokes uptown and thought you were, you were part of that. Yeah, and we fell out for a big time, yeah. and it's never been the same between me and them. How long before Pat was shot was that? Oh, about three weeks, four oh, weeks. It's all about the same sort of time. Mm. Right, so let's break that down. Okay, so Pat's moved in to Nippers in summer 94. That turns into a couple of months, and that turns into a longer stay. November, December, January, into the new year, maybe February. They're all still friends, but they are now getting really out of control. End of January, February, maybe the end of February, this robbery happens where, you know, this uh, robbery happens of these traveler's checks. He says in there, doesn't he, that those traveler's checks were stolen when Pat was still living with him. He says right at the end there, about three weeks before he got shot. So unfortunately, you'll have to rewind and listen to this back yourself, unfortunately, because I can't do anything with this player. I can't rewind back and, and search out little bits of it for you. But he does say in it that Pat's living with him still whilst this incident of the traveler's checks happens. And right at the end, the police officer asks him, how long ago was it before he got shot? before Pat got shot and Nipper says about three weeks, three or four weeks. Now we know that Pat was in hospital about March time and he was sent back to prison in about April time. So all this happened really quickly within the month maybe. So just for argument's sake, let's say six weeks because the time frame of all of this could be a little bit off. He's saying three or four weeks, it could be a little bit longer. So let's say six weeks before April, let's say. So April, he was definitely in prison. He was in hospital just before that, where he had his gun, remember? So let's say the start of April, six weeks before that, this traveler's check incident happened. So we're talking mid-February. So this gentleman's got 60,000 pounds worth of traveler's checks. He had 250,000 pounds worth. He was selling for 60,000. Nipper went to Tony, Tony went to a mate, and they couldn't raise the money so he chopped that deal in half 125 grand's worth of traveler's checks for 30 grand and it was set up by nipper to do that deal for tony pat and craig now it's quite unclear to me exactly how many traveler's checks were actually in that deal in the end it didn't matter anyway because they got them for free but it was set up by nipper that his mates, Tony Tucker, Pat Tate, would buy these traveller's checks. So they turn up for the deal, the bloke comes out with the traveller's checks. Tony, Pat Craig have no intentions of paying for these traveller's checks whatsoever. They're going to rob them. And they do that in the form of a beating. They literally beat these traveller's checks out of this person. They rob him and then Nipper's like, look, you can't, you're, you're treat, these are my mates. You're treating people like shit. You can't do that to people. Obviously, Tony Pan Craig don't give a shit. Tony Pan Craig have literally robbed a massive stash of money here. And it just goes to show how fearless Tony Pan Craig were. This is a massive amount of money that they're robbing here in the form of checks. £250,000 worth if it was, or £125,000 worth if it was the half deal. I'm still not clear exactly how much was robbed here but it was either £250,000 worth or £125,000 worth. If it was the £250,000 worth they were being sold for 60 grand so that would mean that they've robbed 60 grand worth of traveller's checks. Flipped over again could be seen that now Tony Pan Craig owe 
60 grand. We'll be coming back to that in a bit. So you can see the downfall already spiraling out of control and you can see that Nipper is in amongst these animal people and he's in serious shit here because Pat lives with him. Now, Tony, Pat and Craig are just about to turn on Nipper and they do it in the way of robbery when they rob his flat. So at this point, we're in full flow of this Tony, Pat and Craig saga that's happening in Essex at this point. They're drug dealing, they're robbing everybody, they're fucked on all these drugs, they're losing their minds, they've lost control and they're not stopping. The levels that they're going to are damaging the reputations of themselves and they're damaging the friendships of all the people that are around them but they just don't care. They're still party animals and it was just a matter of time before Nipper started feeling the brunt of all their aggression. And in Nipper's instant, it came in the way of petty theft. Basically the reason I called them thieving is they were thieving stuff off me. I caught Tony and Pat thieving my stuff. Turns out they were furnishing where Paul and Donna were living. Right, so these are your chapels and your furniture and stuff about your flat. Yeah, almost everything they took went to the to the girls' place. And uh, this night, um, I'm in bed. Donna knew t Tony was at home with Anna. Yep. Paul knew Pat was at home or trying to reconcile his relationship with yep. Sarah. Yep. Uh, my girlfriend's at home and I'm lying in bed watching TV. The phone's run. I picked up, it was Donna. She told Steve to you know where Tony is. So I said, well, he's at home with Anna. Probably fucking the arse off by now. Just sort of stupid things, stupid crap, not what you say. Right. Thought nothing of it, hung the phone up. Anyway, that was on the Sunday. Next Friday and Saturday, Tony and Pat were at my place having a party. This is when I called them feeding the stuff. I thought they were. I didn't, didn't know until like Monday when I was cleaning up my flat and like, I realised they'd actually stolen it. So on the Tuesday morning, the next morning, I... I what you say stuff? What are you talking about? They, they stole stolen my toaster, my kettle, some tea towels, some towels, um, some food, and I think they're taking the iron. I'm not sure. Okay, right, so just little household appliances and... They just like took that. those few things, yeah. yeah. This was on the Friday and Saturday. Yeah. Sunday I've gone back to my flat. It was a complete shithole. I went out for the day. Monday I've come back. No, sorry, Sunday they left. Monday, because I've been sleeping in my car, so I just didn't want nothing to do with them, right. but I couldn't get them out of my house, right. my flat, if you understand. Yeah. Monday, I've gone back, seen this stolen my stuff. I had to do, I can't remember what I had to do on the Monday, but I didn't start clearing up. Well, I started clearing up. Tuesday morning, I'm clearing up. The doors open. As I'm clearing up, I realised I wanted to call Tony and Pat and say, you've thieved off me, I want you out of my lives, I don't want nothing to do with you. Tony Pat are party animals, and they're partying in Nipper's play. Tony is seeing somebody called Donna who has a flat and the next morning after this party Nipper's tidying up and he starts to realise that some of his stuff's missing. Electrical appliances, the toaster, tea towels, little stuff from the kitchen. Later on Nipper found out that they've been taking the stuff from his flat and then putting them into Donna's flat furnishing Donna's flat. So Nipper has said that he's going to pull him up about this because he's getting pissed off with it. He's experienced firsthand and he's experiencing still firsthand these people on these drugs. All of this time they've been, they've come from decent human beings, friends, going out, having a laugh and it's now slowly getting to the point where this is getting to, out, this is getting out of order, out of order so much that they've started robbing his stuff not even affording to go out and buy their own stuff but they're robbing from nipper and and literally furnishing somebody else's flat with it that to me sounds quite desperate but it's in like a a very subtle way of saying to nipper that they don't care we're taking your stuff and that's it end of story but in there you'll hear that donna has tried to contact nipper and he's trying she's trying to find tony tony as we know had a wife which actually clears up everything. Donna isn't Anna, just for the record there. It has been suggested that, well, personally, I believe that Anna is the same person as this is Donna, but I think we can safely say that, no, they are different people. Anna did exist. And Nipper thinks Tucker's with Anna. So Donna's phoned Nipper, trying to find Tony. Nipper is literally just as people do, I oh know he's not here, he's probably fucking the arse off Anna by now. Just passing conversation, nothing 
said in malice, nothing, in a vicious manner, not taking the piss, just one of those things. I, th I said to my girlfriend, I said I wouldn't have said that, she goes, that's the sort of, sort of stupid thing you would say. Yeah. But I mean, as I, said, I, I mean, I obviously used to speak about this in prison, I speak yeah. about it all the time. Yeah. Not because I think I'm something clever because I told them to fuck off, or not because I think I'm something clever or brave or heroic or anything, but it's when you talk to people, you talk about things, right? The amount of blokes who would say, oh yeah, he's fucked the arse up, it's just something you say. Yeah. And because Tony thought he was the big fucking art nut and the piece of shit that he was and he was cracked out his head, he thought, come round and teach me a lesson. Because I was basically fucking him off, he wanted to come round and sh he wanted to yeah, fuck me off. Yeah, he was a bit of an embarrassment. Yeah, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah, the big old Tony yeah. fucker, yeah. the big old Tony fucker, don't get fucked off by a little cunt like me, yeah. you know? And that's what, that's what it blew, all yeah. out of proportion. Yeah. But the most he should have done was come round and like said, don't talk to me, bird like that, or smack around the face. Don't mean, give her a bit of respect. She to Nipper, it was nothing. It was just one of those passing comments that you say as a bloke. He just basically said that just, he said it a million times. It's just something that he would say. Unfortunately for Nipper, Tony Tucker hasn't taken this news too lightly. As Donna's phone Nipper and Nipper said that, she's obviously got really offended and gone to Tucker and told him what Nipper said. But it would seem that something's either been exaggerated or misheard and Tony's going off his head because of what Nipper said. So now Tony's on the warpath and wants a word. As I'm cleaning up, the door's opened. Like Tony, because Tony was such a great mate, I'd give him a set of keys to my yeah, house. Yeah. Pat had a set of keys. Yeah. I'd set my girlfriend to the set, right? Door's open, Tony's walk over. See, now Tony committed an offence here. Now me saying it, I can't. He's dead, isn't he? He's dead, yeah. yeah. Right, Tony walked in, um, basically about a week, two weeks before, he had, he had a 2 2 revolver in my house. Yeah. He left it there. Yeah. I don't know if he meant to leave it there on purpose or okay. what. I come across the revolver, looked like it was a real gun, I was in the like looked at it, yeah. cleaned it, took, made sure my prints were off it, and put it in yeah. the cupboard. So when Tony came round again, he'd take it when he wanted it. He must have known about it actually, because uh, he'd been there again and he hadn't taken the gun. So uh, the doors opened, in walked Tony. Craig and another person who I won't say. So Craig, Craig, Craig Rolf. Craig Rolf, and yeah. Tony Tucker. Yeah, and another person. I mean, when I was interviewed for Pat's attempted murder, you, you added the names, but I won't say the names, this bloke's still alive. They walked in. I didn't want to pull Tony in about the thieving because I didn't want to put him on the spot where he's got to beat the shit out of me. I just basically said, all right, Tony. He said, all right, he, they used to call me Nipper, that'd be nickname. And he said, all right, Nipper, he said, where's the gun? Or he said, where's the thing? And he made a hand signal of a gun. I said, oh, yeah. As I've given it to him, He's, he's lifting me up by, with his left hand by the throat and he's just lifting me up the floor, popping me against the wall, put the gun in the head and he gets saying, you little cunt, fuck my bird up the arse, fuck my bird up the arse, you little cunt, I'm going to show you what this can do. Went on for 20, 30 seconds, I don't know. They, pulled me, they took me back into a back bedroom, put me on the bed, Tony was kneeling in the stride of me, kept stabbing the gun in the head saying, you little cunt, I'm going to show you what this can do and fuck my bird up the arse. I noticed he was frothing in his mouth, his eyes were out of his head, I knew he was cracked up. Yeah. I basically thought, all that was going through my mind was I want to see my sisters grow up and I want to see my girlfriend leave. I knew he was going to kill me and I thought it won't hurt, it's no good struggling, it won't hurt, I just won't even know a bane and I was going to be dead. Anyway, he was on me, he kept rounding on me, took my necklace, he uh, told me he wanted to take my girlfriend's jewellery. Really. Yeah. I just said, yeah all right, I'm not saying yeah all right, you can take it, just yeah all right. I was confused, I was yeah. fucked up, I didn't know what was happening. Yeah. He uh, put the gun away, pulled out a meat cleaver and uh, said, right, you've got to pay uh, your hand or your foot. So I thought, well, if he chops off my foot, I can't walk. If he takes off my hand, I can still shoot him. Then, when he did that, I thought, I'm going to shoot you, you cunt. That's all I thought. I sat, I was sitting on the bed, I held out my right hand, held it up in the air, I turned away and shut my eyes and thought, oh, I knew I was going to scream, I knew I was going to cry, I knew it was going to hurt, and I was just waiting for it to happen. After about 10 seconds, nothing happened. I opened my eyes, looked at him, and he was just standing there, big grin with a meat cleaver in his hand. With that, he put the meat cleaver in his jacket and walked out of the bedroom door. I jumped up. The third person who was there, or by name, was grabbed hold of me, and I said, what the fuck have I done, Tony, you're a cunt. I said, why are you doing this to me? This bloke said, calm, leave him, let him calm down, it'll be all right. I said, what the fuck have I done? I pushed him away, gone to walk towards Tony, he's turned around, pulled out the meat cleaver again, and he's lifted it up to hit me in the head. Well, I just stood there and I thought, well, fucking do it if you're going to do it. With that, this other person grabbed hold of me and Craig, and they pushed me back in the bedroom, and said, then leave him, let him calm down. With that, they walked out and left. I sat on my bed for about five or ten minutes. I don't really know, I just couldn't understand. So Nipper being Nipper and actually rating Tucker as a great friend, 
That has now been flipped on its head because of this one thing the Nipper said to his girlfriend Donna. As I said, it sounds to me like something's been misheard or relayed back to Tony in the wrong way, exaggerated or shit stirring or whatever. She's offended with what Nipper said and it may be that she now wants to get Nipper into so much trouble that could be a jealousy thing there, couldn't it? Nipper's said, oh yeah, he's probably fucking Anna up the arse by now. She got really offended because she's the girlfriend. She cares about him. She loves him. She thinks the world of him. She's his girlfriend. And he's there saying he's probably fucking somebody else up the arse by now. I wouldn't be surprised that she was a little bit offended by that. So she's gone off to Tony and now probably shit stirring, maybe crying. But I would say that's a little bit of jealousy there. And again, I'm only guessing because I don't know. But she may have literally exaggerated the situation. Got onto the phone crying. This, that and the other. Nipper said this, that and the other. Saying that, you know, he wanted to fuck me up the arse. All this, blah, blah, blah. Tony's got the wrong end of the stick. Or even exaggerating himself. Just so that he can cause trouble. That just seems to be the person he is. And it seems to be just like a switch. It doesn't matter how friendly they are to each other. It's one thing, one tiny bit of speech that can just switch from friend to foe. And by the sounds of it, it's quite an aggressive incident. Tony's got a key. Nipper rates him enough for him to have his own set of keys to his flat. Tony doesn't actually live there, but he's holding some of his stuff. He's incriminating himself by having Tony's gun in his place. That's how much of a friend Nipper is to all of these people and Tony is back to them. But they rate each other, they trust each other and Nipper has said yeah, he's, he'll keep his gun there. He even says in there that he cleaned it for him. He cleaned, took his gun and he put it in there. Tony's walked in with Craig and some other bloke, not mentioned what, who it was. Tony's looking for the gun Nipper has no idea that Tucker is fuming with him. Nipper, according to himself, has no idea that he said anything wrong. And as Tucker's got close, he's grabbed him, pinned him up, grabbed him around the throat, pinned him up against the wall, and begins the what is now famous incident in this story between Nipper and himself. The meat cleaver incident. He's taken Nipper from the kitchen and thrown him into the back room to the to his bedroom. He's put him on the bed. Tony's produced a meat cleaver and he said, "Put he, he's given Nipper a choice. Handle your foot. He's going to chop up. Nipper's going to pay for this. He's upset the girlfriend so much that it's upset Tony. And now Nipper deserves to lose his hand or his foot because of this. So you can tell already that the it's just so overly exaggerated the way Tony's blown all this out of proportion. It's nothing, according to Nipper. And Tony goes on, he robs the jewellery and he gives the ultimatum, you handle your foot. So Nipper, thinking on his feet there, is like, he's going to kill this man, he hates him, doesn't like him anymore. From the kitchen to the bedroom, they've gone from friends to enemies and they hate each other Tucker's now gonna deform Nipper for the rest of his life and Nipper knows this and Nipper thinking on his feet very quickly says that he can still shoot him if he takes one hand if he takes his foot he can't run after him now that is really classy thinking I personally wouldn't be thinking that when somebody else has got a meat cleaver asking me whether I'm gonna lose my hand or my foot but still this is what Nipper says that happened. And so they've gone from friend to enemy in that space of time. They hate each other now and they're out to kill each other. Tucker's going to use a meat cleaver and Nipper's thinking about on how to shoot this man. But Tucker, somewhere in that incident, has second thoughts and says no, he's not going to do it. Nipper's put his hand out, say take my hand. Tucker somewhere has gone, no, I won't do that. Let this be a warning to you. Don't fuck around. Don't say the wrong thing. And gone to leave. Now, Nipper has jumped up from that, from being threatened with a meat cleaver. He's jumped up to go after Tony. And then Craig and this other blast pushed him back in and said, 
Look, don't let him calm down. He's got a gun on him now and a meat cleaver. Calm down. Everything will work itself out. We'll be all right. Don't worry about it. However, things are just about to start getting bad. So this happened Saturday, Sunday, Monday. He was cleaning up, found out that he was robbing all of his electrical items. And Tuesday, this happened with the meat cleaver. Nipper gets scared and sleeps in his car. He's, he either sleeps in his car Monday or Tuesday evening because he doesn't want anything to do with them. This has happened and this is the end of the line for him. He's scared, he can't even go back to his own place. On the Tuesday day, I did sleep, I slept in my car that night because I was scared to go home. Next morning I've gone in, went in through the back door, I had a knife, that was all I had. Yeah. It turns out as I walked in, I knew something was wrong. It's been in some of the microwave, can call the TV, video. Right. Some Oh, my clothing, and they wiped their arse on all the clothing they left and snug it on the end. So I, I got on the phone straight away to Pat, his phone was turned off. I got on the phone for Tony. I said, where's my stuff? I want my fucking stuff back. And he just laughed. I said, I'm going to fucking kill you, you piece of shit. And he just laughed at me. I then phoned up my friend again saying, look, the cunts have been in here. I told them what they'd done. And he said, I can't get involved. He said, try so-and-so. I phoned up so-and-so. They didn't want to get involved. So, uh, again. You phoned up? I, I phoned up this person that after I knew. Weapon. After this, a gun. This is the third person that was... No, this is a person that Pat, Pat, Pat introduced me to. Right. Um, you were wearing an armour? You're yeah, yes, he, he, he used to supply guns, yeah. or he, he used to, he's in prison now. Okay. And uh, I phoned him up, he couldn't get me a gun, he suggested somebody else, he couldn't get me a gun. Um, basically, so this was Wednesday, I was going around trying to get a gun. Wednesday night, I again slept in the car, went back Thursday morning, they'd been in the flat, totally destroyed, they'd taken everything. I mean, they'd, they'd smashed everything, they'd wiped shit everywhere. They'd, they'd just totally ruined your house. So bye now. Tony Pound Craig are at full loss of control. The drugs have taken over and they've turned on Nipper. Nipper's frightened to even step foot in his own home. But armed with a knife, he does return and he finds that his flat's been robbed of everything. Tony Pound Craig have robbed, they have robbed everything from Nipper's flat. Not only have they robbed everything from Nipper's flat, they've destroyed it apparently according to Nipper and they've wiped shit all over the walls. Now when I say shit, it is human shit. They have literally defecated on the floor and wiped it all over the walls. This is a prime example of how drugs make you think of nothing more than your own satisfaction and how you don't care for other people. And these drugs will make you feel that it's all right to do this sort of stuff. Somewhere in that incident, one of them, Tony Pat or Craig, thought that it was all right to shit on the carpet and all right to pick that shit up and all right to spread it all over the walls. It's disgusted Nipper. He knows now he has to do something about this. He's already holding a knife. He's walked back into his own place holding a knife. Now, I can pretty much guarantee that that knife would have been used if any of those three were in there after seeing the the state of his place and that he'd been robbed. If he'd actually caught them in action robbing his place, I'm more than sure that one of them would have got stabbed. There would have been a fight. There would have been something completely horrific happen. So that said, I mean, for whoever's sake, I suppose it's a good thing that nobody was there when he was holding that knife because somebody would have got seriously injured if not killed. Nipper, no doubt, could have been a triple murderer himself right there and then, should he have found them in his flat. You just don't know, do you? So, in a way, it's a good thing. But it didn't, and Nipper's lost all his stuff. It's got on the phone, he wants all his stuff back. Again, another prime example of how Nipper is now going to start defending himself. He's not taking this shit. He's phoned him up. His phone took her. I want all my stuff back. Tucker's laughed in his face saying he's going to kill you. That's the first time we hear of a threat, a death threat. You hear that, you start worrying then, don't you? Not only have they robbed him and smeared shit all over the walls, they're now threatening him with his life. And Nipper takes the action that he's got to arm himself now. He's got to try and find a gun from somewhere. Only a gun is going to do this little knife that he's carrying isn't going to work. He knows now this has got so serious that he needs bullets. He needs proper protection. So he phones around. Asking people if they can get a gun, they can't do it. Somebody asks somebody else, they can't do it. They just don't want to get involved. 
and there are people, the feedback from people are saying, we don't want to get involved with this. This is Tony Power Craig. They're out of control. They're fucking everything up. And they're animals. They're monsters. We don't want anything to do with it. They don't even want to get involved in getting a gun that could possibly be used to shoot these people. And again, it's all that fear thing, that fear factor. And it just gives you that clearer insight about that whole mentality there. Can you get me a gun? Who's it for? Fucking Tony Pan Craig. Fuck that, no way. Because you have to kill them all together, don't you? That's one of those things. You have to kill them all together. Because if you kill one, you've got the other two. If you kill two, you've got the other one on your back. It's a never ending circle. So these three have to go all together. So Tony Pan Craig have to go all together, I would say. And people are realizing that and they don't want anything to do with any handgun shooting of Pat in the leg or whatever. You know, they don't want to shoot Tony in the kneecaps to warn him, to tell him to shut up because then he's got fucking Pat Tate to deal with. They can't shoot both Tony and Pat in the legs, in the legs just to tell them to stop because they will get better and when they get better they'll come back fighting. So nobody wants to get involved. It has to be all three together. So this is it. This is the beginning of the war.